Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another week of sessions. Uh, let's just begin this week, this day, with a word of prayer. Uh, yes, could one of us please lead us in prayer? Maybe Shri Kumar, uh, can you please lead us? Oh, thank you. Okay, Kennedy, you can go ahead if you'd like to. Let, 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 let us just. Thank you for today and for this great moment that you give us, our Father Jehovah. Father, I dedicate everybody into my mighty hand, Father Jehovah, to bless us, whatever we're going to learn, Father Jehovah. I commit uh, to Jan Emmanuel as we go to bless him in this, Father Jehovah. We thank you for your blessing, Father Jehovah, and we commit to the name of the night, and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kennedy. All right. So we have come to the end, almost to the end of chapter nine. Uh, at chapter nine, we started last week, we looked at how to steward a revival. The word steward means is to, uh, you know, to take good care of God entrusts us with many things. And we as leaders, as ministers of God, are to be good stewards of what God has given us. And um, we looked at that example from Matthew 13, uh, how separating the wheat from the chaff. And, and so we also looked at a few examples on how, on, not examples, but biblical instructions on how to keep the house of God clean. Right. Uh, why is it important? Because we know that the church, the house of God, is God's dwelling place, his resting place. And it's very important that, you know, uh, we may be people who have just you know, started our own ministry or maybe we are already serving in a church or you're planning to start your own church. These are very important uh, biblical instructions on how to steward a ministry or how to uh, you know, uh, make God's house a dwelling place. Right? So we looked at a few points. I'll just go over a few of them. First was to keep the house clean, which means no sin in the house. Uh, encourage uh, your church members, teach your church members, uh, teach the believers how to, you know, um, uh, uh, overcome the works of the enemy, how to uh, keep the temple pure, how to live a holy life. So we teach that. Do not give the devil pulpit time. Uh, so the pulpit is meant for preaching and teaching the word of God and not to uh, you know, condemn other ministries or condemn people, uh, but simply to keep the house clean. Two, we looked at was keeping unity in the spirit. We looked at this even in the book of Acts, where the believers were in unity, whether they were Gentiles, whether they were Jews. Uh, we saw that when they were there was unity, there was a powerful move of God, right? Uh, so unity is pleasant in God's eyes. So even we. Uh, uh, in the ministry, in the church, we will have people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different ideas, different you know thought patterns, different understandings of the word of God. Uh, just because somebody has misinterpreted the word or they have a wrong interpretation of the word doesn't mean that we just break off from them. No, we can teach from the word of God and continue to build unity, uh, uh, you know, uh, bring correction, remove jealousy, strife, anger, backbiting, selfishness. Uh, and we also took that example of, uh, you know, uh, Mars Hill Church, where, uh, you know, this is a church in the United States, it was a very fast growing church, wonderful church. Um, and, you know, he was a man who the leader was very, you know, he had this whole thing of I am the leader and nobody can, you know, take my position. And so he was very abusive in the way he would talk and he would condemn other religions. And so what happened was within the church, there were people who uh, were for him. There were people for, who were saying, no, we need to change. We need to make sure that, as you know, uh, that he changes his behavior. And so there was division within the church itself. And. A, ch a, a church or a house divided in itself would not stand. Right? So unity is a very important key. 
then we looked at keeping a humble heart humble heart is a key god responds to those who are hungry and humble for him right uh, humble before him god resists the proud right so even if god is using us in different ways in powerful ways that's wonderful uh remember to maintain that spirit of humility right no matter how high god takes us we say god thank you it is through you and so we maintain that spirit of humility one of the things that we've noticed is especially you know when ministries are very small right? you got 50 people you got 100 people uh, the church is still small um, it's easy to be humble right? uh, because you got a small ministry but as the church grows you know maybe gets up to 500 and 1000 people and 1500 it is very easy to let pride creep in right uh, this comes not only for the pastors and leaders but also for those who are in worship ministry those who are on the stage most of the time you got people who are worship leaders they're going to be on the stage they're leading the worship it's very easy for pride to come and we got maybe some good bible teachers and they come uh, they are you know serving in the church they've given been given opportunities it's very easy for pride to come and so we need to maintain a heart of humility and also teach it to our leaders and our uh, and the believers in the church when we looked at keeping god as the focus right it's it's not about i am building my house my kingdom no it's about building god's house building god's kingdom right strong leadership is important uh leadership itself must not be the focus but you know we, we need to raise up leaders with a kingdom mindset right that the mindset should be hey i'm in this because god has called me and it's not because of my own abilities it's not because of my own talents but it is god using me to build his kingdom so the moment we get that mindset it won't matter what you know what people think and uh, meaning uh, you know whether we are small in our own eyes or big in our own eyes it won't matter right we just know our identity in christ then we looked at two other important things maintaining the prayer uh, within the community and staying with what is important right meaning prayer is is like a fuel right so for example you have a vehicle uh, you may have the most expensive vehicle in the world but without fuel that vehicle is not going to move without petrol or diesel gas it's it's not going to move right it may be worth you know huge amounts of money very costly car very costly bike without the fuel it is nothing it is it's not going to work it's just going to be sitting there and there's no point if a person has bought this wonderful big car and he says okay i'm going to drive it everywhere and then not fill petrol into the car what's going to happen it's going to just stop there and he's just going to be sitting in it's of no use he's not making use of the vehicle the same way when god when we are praying when we are asking god for a revival prayer is the key we need to pray we need to seek god okay i'm not seeing it lord i'm not seeing the revival i'm not seeing a move of god continue in prayer right and then we also looked at very important teaching of the word of god right there will be signs there will be wonders there will be miracles there will be there will be wonderful we saw the example in the book of acts where peter's shadow was healing people uh, but what did they do after that they went back and began to teach the word of god right the focus didn't go to angels but right? angels came and you know uh, helped peter come out of prison uh, the focus didn't go to angels when peter's shadow was healing people it didn't go to the focus didn't go to peter or his shadow they didn't repeat the whole thing again okay let's try it in another city no the focus in the early church was teaching of the word of god that was important and that is why we need to stick with the important it's good if god is giving us visions on angels and you know all these other things it's good but because of that do not dilute 
or do not, you know, uh, stop teaching the word of God, right? It is the word that empowers. It is the word that leads and guides us. So always remember, no matter what supernatural we see in our life, right? That's wonderful, you know, healings, miracles. It's, it's wonderful. It's God working through us. But because of these things, do not let the teaching of the word uh, be, you know, taken, taking the back seat. The teaching of the word should be first. What does Paul say? You know, Paul has gone through his entire life and he has seen wonderful miracles. He has healed the blind. He has done all kinds of miracles. He's seen the supernatural, right? He says, you have seen the third heaven. You know, I saw a vision of a man who went up, you know, uh, so he's seen everything, I would say. But what does he say in his last letter to uh, Timothy? He's in prison. He's going to die. He's going to be uh, put to death. Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, you may have seen all these miracles, but what does he say? Preach the word in season and out of season. Meaning there will be people who will come and say things. There will be people who will say this is better, that is better. No, preach the word in season and out of season. So our focus, right? Not only if we are praying for revival, for anything, for any ministry, the moment our foundation is built on the word of God, we have a strong foundation. Right? That is why in, in APC, what we do is we, we give a solid 50, 45 to 50 minutes of teaching of the word of God. Right? Why? Because we know it's only the word that can build others. Testimonies can encourage others. Right? Even what we've been doing, revivals, we've been studying all these revivals. It only builds faith in us. It encourages us. It, it you know, helps us to say, hey, God, God was able to do it before. He's able to do it now as well. So it, it does something in us. It encourages us, builds faith in us. But we cannot keep studying about uh, you know, these uh, revivals and say, okay, I've done my part. No, no, no. We need to get to the word. We need to teach the word, preach the word, read the word, ask God for revelations of his word. That is when, you know, there will be an outpouring of his Holy Spirit among us. Right? Then we also looked at consolidating what is being released. Now, every ministry, as it grows, very important to consolidate. The word consolidate means to strengthen. Right? You have a ministry, you've got maybe 50 people, start strengthening it in the sense, start raising up leaders. Uh, you know, I remember we were uh, in the city of Manglo. Uh, when I came here, we were only about 12 people and 12 to 13 odd people. And uh, I remember telling those 12, uh, about 13 to 15, some Sundays, some students would come. And, and so uh, we were averaging 12 to 15. And I remember the first few Sundays, they were all new to me. All 12 of them were new to me because I moved, relocated from another city to Mangalore. And the, the first or the second Sunday, I began, I told the church, right, uh, how, how many of you want to volunteer uh, in this team, uh, in the PPT, you know, PowerPoint presentation? How many of you want to volunteer in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the book table? Uh, there were only 15, 12 to 15 people. And then, then we started Bible studies. Uh, in that Bible studies, about five of them would come. But what we did was we wanted to build a strong team, right? Uh, Jesus did that. Jesus followed that, right? He had 12 disciples, but he had an inner circle, Peter, James, and John, and he built them. He knew that they were going to do something, right? Uh, and and so even what, what I did was I began to, you know, just recognize a few of them from the 12, giving them opportunities. I would say, hey, why don't you, uh, they were elderly gentlemen. And so we began to give them opportunities as well in the church. And so it was wonderful uh, that as a church, we are really strong now. We have a nice team uh, that is really strong and able to, you know, uh, take things forward, even in uh, my absence as well. So, uh, so consolidate and strengthen what we have. So we'll start from point eight, page 104, which is create and maintain 
revival culture to strengthen and sustain revival. Now, the word culture is very interesting, right? Because culture is defined by language, really our, our social habits, our, our, at, our attitudes, music, arts, so many things, right? Now, for example, within a nation itself, there are different types of cultures, right? Let me take the example of India itself. If you go to North India, the culture there is very different, right? Uh, you, you have to enter the church, you have to remove your slippers. They prefer boys, men and women sitting separately. Uh, it's very different, right? Uh, uh, they prefer sitting on the ground. Uh, they prefer, you know, uh, some cultures have praise songs first, then they have announcements, and then they continue with worship songs. So it's, it's different, right? Now, that is just the essence of the churches, right? Now in South India, it is, you know, we can go in with the, with the shoes and, you know, in, in North India, if you take partake in the Lord's table with the shoe, they will be really offended. Right? They will think that, hey, you don't have any respect for the Lord and for the Lord's table. Right? That's a culture, right? But oh, a church culture should also be God focused, not only focusing on all these other aspects, right? It should be God focused uh, in the sense that, you know, all these other things are there, the practical aspects, practical things that we do. But what we build in a church, right? The culture of the church really depends on the leaders. What kind of culture we develop within the church? Now, especially if you're starting a small ministry, ministry is small. It's very important to build a culture there, right? Uh, so somebody asks, how do I build a culture? You make a note of things that you would like to see in the church, right? Uh, for example, if the church is small, is about 10 people, you want to see this church becoming a, a, a church with a strong worship team. So you build that culture in the sense you begin to teach about worship, teach about what worship does. Well, what is the power of worship? And, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're building that culture. If you want your uh, church to be more of a church that is open to people, loving everyone, right? We need to show it first, right? Uh, uh, like, for example, one of the things we do in APC is we never talk about other ministries, never right it's a culture we don't we don't gossip uh, uh and then I, I can i believe i can say that for the church in Mangalore, we are about maybe about 50 to 60 averaging 60 or uh, none of them none of them gossip in the church i can boldly say that uh, why i why do i say that is because we uh, you know, when we started off, we, we believed that we should not, right? So I also began to teach it in the church. I said, no gossiping, no talking about other churches. Uh, uh, in the pulpit, in, uh, you know, no condemning other churches. And so we don't do that, right? Uh, uh, there's, and what, another thing that we have in church is we, we believe that all of us are ministers of God. So whether you're a pastor, whether you're a leader, whether you're just a believer, uh, all of us are equal. So there's this whole sense within the church that whether we are in the worship team or whether we are in the prayer team, whether we are on the pulpit or no, we all are equal. And I see that in the church. It is because we have built that culture. Now, if we build, build a wrong culture within the church, for example, we, you know, we got leaders who are saying, okay, uh, you know, the, the, this is me only, uh, you know, uh, you got leaders probably, uh, you know, talking bad about other ministries or leaders who always, you know, uh, have problems with people or always angry, upset, finding faults. We are going to see that kind of culture in the church. Right. So remember, people see and learn, people learn what they see more than what they hear. It's the truth, right? Maybe we preach Sunday sermons, we can preach a lot. That's good. But 
they also learn what they see. They also learn what they see. Because when they see, they say, okay, the leader is doing this, so even I want to do this. Right? Or if they hear the leaders or the pastors speaking this way, then even they will want to do that. Right? Because we are in a place of influence and people want to, you know. So maintain a revival culture, a culture where it is, you know, the presence of God focused, right? Uh, not about program schedules. Those are also important. But the, the, the focus is God, right? Uh, we recognize and value the work of the Spirit even when we do not have all the answers, right? Uh, sometimes we've been praying, praying, and we may not see the answers, but we will see moves of God. Right? Uh, like, for example, yesterday at church, we had a wonderful time of worship. Right? The worship was so powerful. Uh, it was just like we didn't want to stop. And it was just so wonderful. Everyone uh, was sensing the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? It, it was very wonderful. I personally was minister to everyone. I could see people were engaging in worship. People were in tears. People were really worshiping the Lord. And it was wonderful to see that. And so there will be times when things are just not so. You know, there will be times when uh, you're, you, you know, you may be on fire for God, but you see that the church is not reciprocating or they're just, uh, you know, they're just worshiping the Lord, but there's no outward expressions and all of it. Don't be discouraged, right? Um, I, I remember initially I would be very discouraged, but I learned that uh, just because people don't, uh, you know, respond doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not working. He is working. Maybe sometimes he's waiting, right? So, so we are not to, uh, you know, say, okay, uh, we will not press on because we are not seeing results. No, we can press on, right? A revival culture is eagerly expecting and pursuing the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, right? So even as a church, encourage, teach, teach your people, uh, your believers, your uh, you know, your life group, uh, cell groups, and whichever group you're in, teach them, hey, we can expect, we can pursue the move of the Holy Spirit. We can just be 10 people in a small group sitting and praying. You can really pursue after God, right? Expect them for the move of the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes, you now we have this mindset that only when we are in the physical church, God will move. Right? Uh, or there will be an amazing outpouring, or God will bring healings and deliverance. No, that's that's a wrong mindset. Right? Remember the layman's revival? They were meeting for prayer in the afternoon. Probably they met in the streets, or they met in a small room. Right? Uh, they, they were not in a church, right? because it was in the middle of the day. It was their, during their lunch break. They were not in church. Remember the revival in Hybrids Island? Those two old women uh, who had double arthritis and partially blind. They were at home praying. Two old women in their 80s. They were not at church. So, uh, so it's not about the manifestation of the Spirit only happens when we are in the church. Uh, we can be at home. We can be in our cell group meeting. We can be in our family prayers. God can move. So you continue to, you know, uh, maintain that revival culture, especially when people in your team or your, uh, the church members are losing interest, encourage them and take these examples. Give them these examples. Hey, God has done it before. We, our duty is to pray. If we don't see the results, it's all right, but we are praying for something and we are praying in line with God's word. We're not asking God for something that is not in the word of God. It's not, we're not asking God something that is too difficult for him. No, we're praying in line with God's word. So encourage your believers. Encourage the, the, the sheep in your fold. Tell them that we can press on, right? It's not a waste, right? A revival culture is one where prayer, worship, 
teaching of the word, ministry of the word, making disciples, making new believers. This is a constant thing and people are passionate about it, right? Uh, so we need to, you know, build that culture and encourage people, tell them, hey. Now, here's the difficult part as leaders, right? Uh, maybe some of us are leaders. You may be very passionate about winning souls. Or you may be very passionate about disciples, discipleship. But you see that your church members aren't, you know, they, they just prefer, you know, coming to church, uh, you know, serving in the church and going back home. Again, don't be discouraged, right? Give them time because you can't expect somebody to immediately, you know, start going and doing uh, evangelism or start reaching out to people uh, because they're not used to it. Give them time, teach them. Ask them what are the questions they have. Ask them uh, what is what is stopping them. Uh, build faith in them. And even after that, they may be you know little. Uh, uh, they may say, "Okay, I need some more time." It's all right. Give them time. But what you're doing is you're sowing the seed. You're helping them to understand that this is the culture of the church. And this is what we want to do. Right? Eventually, they will. They will reach out. Right? They will bring people. They will talk to other people. That whole thing of prayer, worship, ministry, disciple making, all of those cultures will get embedded in them as you keep teaching them. And the ninth point is love people. Take care of people. Now, ministry is all about people. It's not about the church setting. It's not about the stage, about the lightings, about the instruments. It has nothing to do with that. Ministry is about people. Paul writes it wonderfully. He says, you are my crown in the presence of God, uh, not the missionary journeys. You are my crown. So remember that love is the key. Uh, and Paul writes it so beautifully in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, where he's inviting the church and he's He's, 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 you know, he's encouraging them. He's saying, hey, you, you all, you have, you know, wonderful gifts, prophecy, word of knowledge. And I'm glad for you uh, because they, most of them were from the, um, you know, idol worshippers, Gentiles who have come to the Lord. And there were a few Jews as well. Uh, but they were already very quickly flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. And, uh, prophecy, word of knowledge, gift of healing, working miracles. Paul is writing and saying, all of this is wonderful, but without love, it is a sounding gong, which means it is useless if all of this is done with a mindset of, okay, because I have this gift, I will do it. No. Paul is saying, let love be the core of the ministry more than all the supernatural signs manifestations miracles faith mountain moving faith gifts of the spirit paul says learn to love people paul had it he loved his people right uh, and we know it remember in ephesus it was such a touching uh event where the leaders from Ephesus, they came, they hugged him, they cried together because they knew they would not see Paul again. It was a wonderful, wonderful, you know, expression of Paul's love for the believers. Yes, he was worried about the church. He was also worried about the ministry and the things happening in the church. But his focus was people. Right? Love people. One of the things that we as leaders, especially pastors, that sometimes we may fail in is, you know, for example, there's somebody new, they come to church, right? Uh, and then after that, something happens and they choose to go to another church, right? Uh, maybe they have different reasons. Uh, suddenly we stop, we have some kind of a hatred towards them. Hey, they stop coming to our church. We, it's not, you know, we probably, even if we look at them, somewhere outside, we won't talk to them. Or we get up, you know, we get angry. Hey, he's not coming to our church. Now, if we have that attitude, we are wrong. 
because we are not we are more ministry focused than people focused right so it's very important to guard ourselves there will be people who will speak behind our back as leaders there will be people who will come to church they will be regular suddenly they will leave there will be people who come visit us and they may not come back again but even when you see them later on if you get an opportunity do not hold any grudge upon them do not say hey you didn't care i mean you didn't come to my church so i don't care about you no god loves them and god is calling us to love people have genuine love for people care about them right if uh, uh, you know there are people right now who come to our church uh, uh, where you know they usually go to a kannada a different language church a regional language church uh, and ours is an english service so sometimes they come here uh, maybe the husband or the wife uh, don't understand the you know the uh, regional language and so i know that they are not members of our church i know that they are members of the other church uh, but they come here because you know they can't un- the husband or wife can't understand that regional language uh, it's very easy for me to discount them right uh, say okay anyways they are not regular here or anyways they are not members here so let me focus on the others now uh, god is calling us to care and love for one another desire their good Uh, look out for their well-being demonstrate love through good deeds and kindness ensure that you know your people in the church are well rested and not overworked especially when it's small then it's all right but as the church grows volunteers many volunteers you may have you know staff under you make sure that you know they have their uh, they're well rested and not overworked now here's a very difficult i would say a very difficult uh, aspect of being leaders is to confront people in love you know we confront people who sin in their wrong doings we have to confront them right we cannot t- say to them hey i love you but i'm not going to correct you no so we need to pray and ask god to give us the ability and the wisdom the grace to confront people in love love speaks the truth for the benefit of others right love will correct and address matters that need to be addressed now in the church especially now for example you, you know you may be a young leader in the church and there's somebody in the church who's been there for 20 years right or he has been a believer for 20 years and he or she knows much more or has much more experience in the church than us right but remember that you are the leader god has appointed you as a leader right so it is your responsibility as a leader to bring correction in truth and in love they may be 20 years elder to you right? yet you it is your responsibility because love you know it it it's been for the benefit of the others now on the flip side just because we are leaders we are not to you know uh correct in anger or you know shout at them abuse them verbally uh, we are not to do that right uh Uh, we are not to you know one of the things i've noticed is sometimes when we are correcting people we bring out the old past what all happened you know two years back three years back no that is a very very wrong thing to do right when you're correcting a person uh, correcting a believer just focus on what they are going through at that moment the worst thing to do is bring up things that happened two or three years back uh that's just going to you know you're digging a hole that's going to just push them deeper down so love people care for them take care of your people another important thing is when you are correcting people in love you're obeying god you but you do not have the what do we say uh, uh the whole power on their reaction to the correction 
There are times when people will take it in a good sense and they will continue to serve. There are times when people will get offended and they will leave the church. Right? That is a sad time. Right? They're not yet mature. That's a difficult season. But it's important, uh, you know, to do that. Now, I would like to connect the next point as well. Even as we are leading the revival, uh, leading a, a church or a ministry, there will be people who do not understand. There will be people who uh, will try to bring in different ideologies. They will try to cause different difficulties, different you know patterns. They will try to change the culture within the church. Uh, very important is guard what people has you know what what God has given you. Guard it from human attacks and demonic attacks. Right? There will be people within the church who will try to cause strife, try to bring a different kind of culture, try to cause divisions. God, what God has given you. Right? Don't just leave it. Now, I'm going to share this example. And uh, this happened somewhere in 2000 and, uh, 2019, early 2019. Now, I was new to the church. And we had this elderly gentleman who was in the church. And uh, he's a good man, elderly man. Uh, uh, I'm not saying this example to put him down, but I'm just saying, giving you this example so that we as leaders must be aware and uh, make the right choice. Guard what God is entrusting in our midst, right? So what happened was uh, this elderly gentleman, uh, probably in his... Uh, maybe 50s, early 50s, late 50s. So he was regular to church. Every Sunday he would come. And slowly what happened was the church began to grow. We had a lot of students coming within the church, right? And a lot of these students were girls, right? And uh, uh, what I began to notice was this man uh, would always go next to the girls and hold the girls and take photos with those girls, right? Uh, so I noticed that a couple of Sundays, uh, and then I thought, if I do not do something about it, it's going to be a problem, right? Now, I'm new there, right? It's only about five or six months that I'm pastoring this church. This man, gentleman, has been in the church for probably two years before me as well. So he's been with the church for a long time. Uh, but I noticed that he would, you know, always speak to the girls, always stand with them. Uh, there were times I've noticed that he would also uh, take them in the bike to certain places. And, and I saw this for a couple of weeks. And I thought to myself, if I do not deal with this, this is going to become a big problem. Now the girls are all just 18, 19, 20. Uh, they all just come here from different states to study. Uh, they just finished their, you know, 12th standard and they've come. Uh, and so I remember uh, very prayerfully, I remember calling this uh, elderly gentleman uh, and I sat with him and I, I, I began to talk to him and I said, this is what it is. Uh, I've noticed that this, wherever, you know, whenever you're going, wherever you, you know, within the church, after the church service, this is what happens. Uh, I've seen you putting your hands around them, taking photos. So I want this to stop. I was very, you know, I said it in love, with a lot of love. And she said, no, they, they're actually like my daughters and all of it. So I said, I understand. Uh, you know, uh, I understand they are like your daughters and they are small. But I don't want you to put your hands around the girls and take photos with them. Because there are certain things, certain cultures that we have established within the church. So I don't want you to do this. He was really offended, really offended. Uh, I, uh, he didn't come to church for a couple of Sundays. Uh, and I didn't force him as well, right? I didn't say, why don't you come? Nothing. I just kept quiet. Uh, I thought, let him process what has been told to him. Uh, but eventually... Uh, you know, he slowly started coming, but not every week. Uh, he would come, you know, two weeks out of a, 
out of all the four weeks two sundays he would come but here's the change right uh i saw that he would finish church and he would never go near a girl as well like he didn't go he wouldn't even go stand alone with the girl so i was happy that there was a change but what i also did was i made all the girls in our church come and sit and i and i spoke to all of them and i said see you, you girls are all young you have come here to study and i began to explain to them see they're all just 18 19 20 years old so i began to explain to them how the culture of the church is and how what are certain things that we do and we follow and so they all understood it so they all took it in the right way uh, but why did why did i do this so that it doesn't blow up out of proportion and then later on i'd be like oh i sh- i wish i dealt with this before no so there will be times as a leader you have to watch over your church right do not give any entry points to the devil uh to you know bring in any kind of damage within the church right uh uh we'll just look at a few examples from the lessons of william j seymour uh in the uh, uh the revival that he led uh what kind of a person was william j seymour right he was a quiet gentle meek man uh he was inclusive egalitarian meaning he treated all his leaders equally he was secure in his position so he was all right with people uh starting new ministries he was calm nothing seemed to disturb him um you know he was very gentle gracious soft spoken yet he would bring correction uh whenever needed he was not highly educated but he was very prayerful he was able to voice his opinion on any subject very important he modeled through life example william j seymour modeled his life in the sense that whenever you know there were meetings there were prayers he would be there first he would pray for hours and then he would tell his people you do it right he was open to correction he was very humble obedient to the word of god uh, and he challenged others to do that as well right uh, the only thing he could not do is was to you know build up a strong leadership after him uh, but that was just one disadvantage uh, and that's why the you know the revival just slowly died out but he was a man of god right he supported women in ministry being a black during those days he was he was willing to you know uh, he also gave opportunities to the whites um, especially during those times where they looked at blacks in the wrong way uh, discriminatory way so uh, he was a great leader and god used him very powerfully uh, and so we also uh, are to emanate these qualities in our life right stewarding a visitation into a move of god share the stories find people who are ready to partner with you when i say partner not only for fin- not about financial but partner with you in prayer right uh partner with you in in all the plans and all the things that you are doing uh paul had a partner everywhere it was either barnabas in the first missionary journey second missionary journey paul and silas and then timothy joins there was titus he had people with him so don't work solo look for people who are hungry and who are able to catch the fire that you and i have and uh, and impart into their spirit right use ways uh, revival is a work of the spirit right so pass on what we have received right uh, if if god has blessed you or god has anointed you as a prophet now you can give you know some kind of training impart to others and when i say impart what i mean is you can teach them now you can't teach people how to prophesy but you can guide them you can give them ideas what worked for you what didn't work you know share stories of how uh, even you as a leader have failed at times but how god helped you to overcome those right uh, if if there's a, if you have the gift of healing encourage build faith in others tell them hey it's not about you it's about the work of the spirit it's about god bringing healing so you're encouraging your team 
and then release carriers of revival release carriers of revival to take it far and wide there will be people who want to you know probably start new ministries maybe there are some of them who have uh, been with you for five years and now they say i want to go and start my own ministry let them go do not hold on to them and say no you have to be with me till i finish this ministry no if god is calling people to different places to different ministries release them never hold on never stop what god wants to do in other people's lives right uh, so it's good release them support them pray for them encourage them build them and uh and so even as we come to an end of this entire course uh you know i just want to encourage all of us uh, you know let let us continue to pray for this let us continue to learn and desire and pursue revival uh in, in our cities in our nation in the nations and that's what we want to see amen right so we've come to a close uh any questions any thoughts uh anybody have any questions or thoughts you can please share okay all right so uh so if has it been helpful has it been something that uh, uh, I know there's a lot and a lot of material, a lot of revivals and moves of God that we studied. I hope you've been able to take pointers from each of them and, uh, you know, build on this, apply this in our lives. And uh, me too, you know, I, I keep every now and then, you know, it, it's true that we can't remember all of it. And there are times you can just go back to your notes, look at it, revive yourself, you know, refresh yourself. Uh, and then it's also helpful to, you know, you can teach it in your small groups. You, if you have the whole notes, you can, you know, over the course of maybe six months, you can take and you can teach it in your small groups. If you're doing Bible studies, you can also, you know, go ahead and teach it to your young people, families, anybody. And then I'm sure God is waiting to move in our midst, right? Right. Uh, any other thoughts, any questions? Uh, Right. Yes, Rupa, go ahead. Uh, I think you raised your hand, Rupa. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe by mistake. All right. Uh, what I'll do is uh, probably today or tomorrow, I will uh, uh, post the final uh, ass assessment, right? Uh, the first assessment was for uh, 50 marks. And then this next assessment again will be for 50 marks. And we'll put that together and that will be your final marks as well. So, uh, uh, yes, yes, that's true. Uh, thank you, Rose. Yes, it's wonderful. Uh, right. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, I'll put the semester, uh, the final assessment up on the uh, on the classwork tab, I can go ahead and it's going to be an open book uh, exam. So, uh, and then you can do that. Uh, the, I think the final date, I'll put it as November 26. So you have enough time to complete it. Uh, so from tomorrow, uh, you will not have classes since we finished the portions. Uh, uh, if those of you who have not, uh, who have missed this class, maybe if you have a WhatsApp group within your class, you can just post it that this is the last class. And uh, again, you can go to YouTube. Those who have missed the classes, you can encourage them. You can go to YouTube, to the uh, Bible College channel, and you can uh, also listen to the lessons. All right. Uh, so shall we close in prayer? Pastor, one. Yes, one. yes go ahead. Rupa. Thank you very much. And this uh, revival classes have been very, revived me especially and uh, made me focus on what I can do more as an individual and as a group of church group to bring revival in the places where God has placed us. Thank you very much. And they're really fueling, just like fueling and strengthening. Thank you very much, Pastor. Most welcome. Thank you so much, Rupa. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, 
all of you. Uh, I know it's it's not easy, especially since it's online. It's not easy to, you know, uh, sit through all the sessions. But thank you all for joining with me throughout these sessions, uh, and uh, thank you for being a blessing. So, uh, let's close in prayer, and uh, uh, do remember to, you know, uh, check your final assessments and have it done before the due date. Let's close in prayer, right? Uh, Father, we just want to thank you uh, for this entire course of God. It was such a learning. Lord, it was so great to even just go back to the revivals, to the moves of God, to see how you have moved using ordinary people, doing extraordinary works of God. And Lord, even at this time, in this season of God that we are living in, Lord, we ask that you will continue to pour out your spirit upon your people, O oh God. Lord, I pray that uh, you will teach us to pursue you in the right way. Teach us to focus on you, O oh God. Help us to be faithful, O oh God, not to give up, but to look to you at all times, O oh God. Lord, we also thank you for each and every student, O oh God, that you will, Lord, ignite the fire of your Holy Spirit in each of our hearts, the students, Lord, uh, that they will be used mightily for your kingdom of God. Thank you, God. Uh, I pray your blessing over each and every student. And even as they go through the other courses as well, oh God, may your wisdom, your grace, your understanding, your spirit of understanding be upon them, Lord. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. I pray your blessing over each and every student. Use them, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a great uh, month ahead and uh, have a great time. Uh, all the best with your exams. And I'll see you in the next semester as well. God bless. God bless. Take care. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you too. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. God, God, bless. Bless you. God bless. God bless you and your family. Thank you. God bless.